We've just had the RBA decision for August, and I'm joined this afternoon by Nick Chaplin from Seed Funds Management to talk about it. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Chris. Delighted to be here. What did you think? Surprise? Well, I, no surprise from me. I, I think it. Uh, we've got to a point where it's very finely balanced. You've got. We've we've uh, talked about for a long time about this two-speed economy. There are people that are very much hurting with uh, the thought of rates going up, but we're still fighting inflation too. And so the the concept of reducing rates at this time, I don't think, is palatable palatable to anyone other than those people that might be really wishing that their mortgage was lower. Uh, however, with uh, inflation still sitting roughly around that 4% mark, it's coming through not only the quarterly uh, CPI, but the monthly CPIs confirming that as well. We really need to see a downward trend in that. And I think the RBA governor is of that opinion as well. Uh, so I, I've never really been of the view that we'll see rates drop this year, this calendar year. Um, so not surprising to see that. Um, on the other side of lifting rates to conquer that inflation side of things, that well-poised economy uh, at the moment with um, the unemployment rate also a little bit tentative at the moment, I think that's probably stayed their hand. Well, I think if they put rates up from here, and there was an expectation a while ago from some economists they would, uh, I think that would be as a, a bridge too far. I think that would actually tip the economy because, the, as you say, the economy is finally poised at the current time. It's not as strong as it should be, um, and mm -hmm. inflation is damaging it. Uh, certainly right. What, what I thought was interesting was in the RBA statement this afternoon, the RBA is not expecting inflation to come back to 2.6% or that mid-range until December 2026. It keeps getting extended out. So, 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 <laughs> so that's a long time. It's a very long time. It's more than two years. And so this question about a rapidly receding interest rate level, um, pushing down towards um, lower than 4%, I don't think we're going to see that for some time. You'd have to see a remarkable performance by the economy in a short period of time for that to happen. And across the background of that, you've got an election coming up. So um, you're concerned about not necessarily political interference, but political implications coming in. I think that's the right way to put it, the implications of it. If rate rises were to happen, certainly this particular calendar year, I think there is a risk of, a, of an early election being called. The parties probably want some good news in the market uh, first before that would happen. Uh, we've seen in the past, uh, certainly since 1960, I mentioned to you, there's been nine elections called in November and December since that time. So it's not uncommon to have a late in the year election. And I think the pressure on that is probably a little bit higher due to the fact that the election must be called, called and happened by May. So the earliest election we've had in the calendar year was the 2nd of March. So there is some pressure there. Um, treading lightly, but the RBA must act when they have to act. There can be no real interference there. Let's just move now to the volatility in the markets. And this has really come from the US, obviously. Conce same sort of concerns. You know, Powell was saying that there'd been a, a rate reduction really expected in September. Mm. Uh, Employment numbers came out, and other numbers came out that said perhaps he's waited too long before it's cutting, and that's print the bubble, as it were, of equity markets. Uh, that's flowed on to Australia. Is that valid for it to have flowed on to Australia, seeing as our market has lagged the US market, particularly the tech market? Yeah, I think the validity of flow on into Australia isn't as strong as uh, the markets like to think it is. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The reason for the outperformance in equities in the US has been driven mainly by the tech stocks. It absolutely is a bubble. Um, it can be a little frustrating sometimes that you see the Dow, for example, hit 40,000. We've seen it happen a couple of times. And then it quickly, you get this little shift downwards. This has been a more sizable shift down. We're down around 37,000. See what happens tonight. But then it rebounds again. Um, so, and it is taking, the tech stocks are taking others with them. So uh, I think you will see some rate movement in the US now downwards. 
I'm, I'm astounded at the resiliency of the US dollar value, actually. Um, it's True. versus Australia, at least. We're hovering around that 65 mark. There hasn't been a lot of reaction to the potential for US rates to drop, which would normally drive a higher Australian dollar. But volatility has obviously gone through the roof. Uh, we've seen the VIX up 24, 25. Mm. That's doubled really in the last four to six weeks. Yes. And um, probably in the last four to six days, really, it's just gone for certain. How does this affect your fund, which invests in bonds and hybrids, bank hybrids? How, how do you handle that? And does it flow through to your market, or are you somewhat immune? or protected from that kind of equity volatility? You will certainly see that volatility come through. There is a correlation. It's not a large one. It gets it reduces as you get away from equities. So hybrids are the next ranking up. So you get reduced uh, volatility there. Then you get to subordinated debt and senior bonds. We are in our fund, in the seed funds management hybrid income fund, we manage into those three asset classes or sub-asset classes of hybrids, subordinated bonds and senior. We did make a decision to tilt into the senior side of things and uh, tier two or uh, subordinated notes in advance of this crash. We, we, or if you can call it a crash, Chris, but... Um, I was about to pick you up on that. Yeah, uh, call it, we'll call it a little <laughs> mini bump. Well, I think it's a, it's a significant mini bump. It is. A thousand points is not small. No. Um, however, we did make that decision in advance of this move. We, we saw that um, overperformance, if you like, in equities. If you look at the chart of uh, what was happening to equities before the GFC bump occurred, and that was a crash really, um, it's vastly larger this time around, driven by those tech stocks. So um, that does set off alarms for us, and we move into higher ranking instruments that are less affected from a volatility point of view. That means that when the calm happens, or if you get a value shift in the hybrids, for example, we can pick them up at lower prices and cascade down later. So I like that strategy, and it's one that we employ. So your performance over the past 12 months is around 8.5%, which uh, in a market where you're in, in bonds is a terrific return. Yes. Um, longer term, not as high as that, but obviously interest rates over the past 12 months have, have been, and the last two years have been high. Um, is that sustainable, do you think, or it's just really attractive from a lower volatility perspective for those investors who are concerned about the fact that there's, their portfolio might have come off 10 or 15% in the last week or two? Yes. Yeah, so, well, there is a reliability, if you like, on those base interest rates. So as interest rates do ultimately come down, you're going to get some movement. We're almost 100% floating rate, not quite. Uh, I think two instruments of my 40 are fixed rate. Um, so I'm not necessarily playing for duration as rates come off. But floating rate doesn't take gambles. So you will get those movements down in those returns. Eight and a half to hold up if rates dropped by 1% would be difficult. And I'm not going to be one that pushes into higher risk instruments to maintain it at eight and a half if it's not the logical place for us to be returning. If it ends up being seven and a half and rates are at three and a half cash rates, um, so be it. That's what the, that return will be. But I think we are in for a quite a time where fixed income remains attractive for people as an alternative. And you made a very good point about volatility. It's lower volatility than the equities market. And it's also because of those instruments being what I term pull to par instruments. They generally have a, a full value or par value $100 payable at a certain point in the future, depending on some decisions that need to be made by the regulator and so forth. Whereas equities, you can't predict the future of those values and they can take years to happen. That predictability helps us to actively manage the portfolio to achieve those higher yields. If we can do that with lower volatility, uh, through the ranking of those instruments versus equities and or even versus a pure hybrid fund because we had the senior bonds and the other subordinated bonds, it actually has lower volatility and better performance. So this is attractive for possibly retirees wanting to be able to sleep at night? Very much so because we are working within the bounds of bonds and hybrids that have those dates in the future that we can work off um, rather than someone that... Um, 
I'm not saying get out of equities um, completely, they, uh, but for a piece of a portfolio where you can rest easy on the fact that w that yield is coming through to you, it's being actively managed by a professional manager and you can predict values to a certain extent, um, certainly helps you sleep at night. Nicholas, on that note, thank you very much. My pleasure, Chris.